before we get into the questions, mm -hmm. all the people that's watching, your name and what you do. For sure. So my name is Tay 3K. I'm an MC, media personality, content curator, vibe supplier, all of the above. All of the above. Whatever you need, I got that shit. Okay. Um. So, uh, what what led you to doing the hosting? So I kind of started. It's kind of always been in my personality, like even in school, like elementary school, middle school, high school, shit like that. So. As I got older, once I started getting to high school and they started having like Apollo nights and talent shows and things like that, I was like, you know what? This is the same shit that I do with my friends. I want to do it on a larger scale. So the first really big thing that I did was it was a Apollo night because I graduated from Sula High School in uh, PG County. So I did an Apollo night. And after that, I was just like, nah, this is what I want to do. So continuing with it, I just figured out, okay, well, that's more like kind of formal. So then it kind of translates into parties as I began to get into college. And I'm like, okay, how do I take this and make it into like, like a party play basically. And so then I started doing parties going into college and then I'm like, okay, boom, now I can do concerts. And so that's kind of how all of the pieces kind of started to go together. But like I said, it's always been in me. You feel me? I've always been an outspoken person. I've always been the person to be like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do the question on the border. I'll be the line leader, whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, so what's the three K at the end of your name stand for? So literally, I lied to you not. So in high school, my Instagram name used to be Taylor the Great. So my that was Taylor the Great up until like my sophomore year in college. And I just remember one night I had a dream and I was on a stage and the people in the crowd were saying Tay three K, Tay three K. So I just woke up the next morning. I was like, I'm gonna just run with it because at the time I I was really getting into doing shit and people was putting my names on flyers. So I'm like, what do I really want to go by? Do I want to be Taylor the Great? Like, what is something that's going to stand out, but it's still a part of me? So once that came to me, I just kind of rocked with it and ran with it. And I made it a part of myself as I began to, you know, get older and develop. Three started to become my favorite number. It was also my basketball number. And I was playing basketball. So it all kind of worked cohesively together for me. Mm -hmm. So you did speak on hosting in college. How yeah. were you able to balance your college work and hosting? Because that's, they like two different lives. Yeah, right definitely two polar opposites. I would probably say just time management, honestly. And that's for anything that you do, whether you're an athlete and a student, whether you were an SGA and you were a student, no matter what it is, you got to have time management. So for me, I still don't even understand how I was able to do a thing because I damn sure can't drink like I used to and then get up the next morning and really try to go to work for real. But the best thing that I did was I was like, I want to graduate. That's why I came to school. Me coming and finding this love or my passion being developed at this place is good, but I came here to graduate. It was important for me to make sure that I made it out in four years, no matter what it took. So I feel like I, I took it seriously. I feel like sometimes people could get wrapped up in the college life and they forget about the academics. Like you really got to want to do it because it's going to be so many other distractions in your way. If you don't want to do it, you're not going to do it. Um. So since relocating, from yeah. um, where you were at first. How has um, their experiences been different? So it's, it's a lot different because being at Morgan, I stayed in Baltimore like two years after I graduated. So I became very familiar with the city and then growing up on the East Coast, a lot of the people are kind of the same. Of course, different areas you go to, they're different, but they're kind of cohesively the same for the most part. Out here, the way that people move is a little bit different. They wear those. I'm gonna be honest with you. Like they just wear those. Like people, a lot of people that I've met out here, they they money hungry. You know, Houston is a big city, so it's it's flashy, it's money, it's chains, it's bad bitches, it's Rolls Royces. I'm talking about you could go to a, a regular ass restaurant on a Tuesday and see four Rolls Royces parked just in the front. You're not you're not seeing that in Baltimore. It's like it's just not fucking happening. Like it's it's literally never fucking happening. So people see that and they get attached to that and they like hmm. How can I make people react to me like people react to them when they see that? So they kind of get, I say it's like a, a smoky mirror, basically. You got to see through the bullshit. But I also realize that real recognize real. So if you're in a situation where you feel like, oh, these people not fucking with me or they don't wear shit, you don't even want to associate yourself with them anyways because they not even aligned with you mentally. They not aligned with the shit that you're trying to do. So that's probably the biggest, like the toughest thing I had to learn moving out here like, if they move weird, let them move weird. Just move around them. So that way you don't get caught in the weird shit. 
All right, so your hair, I believe, is a part of your brand. So when somebody see you, they, they're going to see a good hair haircut. There's no, there's no lacking. Right now, you got the waves. And yeah. you're in a different city. And I know it's hard yeah. to find a barber who can actually cut waves. Yeah. Have you had, like, yeah. uh, have you had to go do, like, 10 barbers since you've been in Houston just to get that one good barber? Yeah, probably not 10, but I definitely had to go through a lot because I was scared. Like, I was really scared to let anybody do anything. Because people could, even, even in Baltimore, like, growing up in D.C. and then coming to Baltimore, like, you might go ask for a 10 fade, but in Baltimore, they cut their 10 fades very high on their head. They don't cut them down low. So you go ask for a 10 fade, nigga, you got a mohawk now. Now you mad because this person didn't understand what you were saying. And that's one thing about hair. It'll grow back, but once you cut it off, you at least got to make it look even so you don't let people walk out of here looking crazy. So I definitely have my share of bad barbers in Houston. But the nigga I got now, that's my nigga. I've probably been going to him for like eight months now. He ain't never fucked up. <laughs> okay. All right. What moves led up to you being on 92? It's Kells, right? Yeah, 92 Kells. Yeah. What, what, what happened like for that to take place? For sure. Definitely big shout out to 92 Kells. So what ended up happening was my homegirl, DJ D-Baby, um, she actually knew Kells, who was the owner of the radio station. So me and D had been working um, like as far as MCing and DJing together. Um, and she felt like she saw a lot in me and the things that I was doing. So she had an opportunity where she was like, well, if you want to if you want to try this radio shit, if you want to kind of do some podcasting, here's a platform that you can do it on. I'm like, bet. Because people, they see me out in clubs and shit and they think that's all you do. Like they don't realize that I actually have a degree in communications that like when it comes to planning, developing, framework, all of that, this is something that I actually have skills in. So I'm like, okay, that this is another avenue for me to still get me as a person out there, because no matter what I do, it still take 3K. It don't matter if I'm selling shirts. It don't matter if I'm selling fucking cups. It don't matter if I got a podcast. I'm doing clubs. I'm doing concerts. It's still an extension of me. So I'm like, okay, bet. So that's really how I started working with 92 Kells. And because it was something new for me, I was like, okay, let me make sure that what do I want my target audience to be for this? Let me make sure that I have it organized in this way so that the, the flow of the show does well. How do I get it out to people? Because radio is not something that's in high demand right now when it comes to entertainment. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people got music streaming services or they're using YouTube and shit like that. So how do I get people to want to listen to this show for an hour or for 30 minutes? Okay, boom, I'm going to start going live. Okay, so now people can interact with me real time and I'm talking in real time on a recording that you could refer back to, but I'm talking to people, they, they tweeting me or they saying something on the live, I can respond to them then. Now when they listen back to it, they feel a part of the show. So I just made sure that I use it as something where I could continue to brand and really just grow my audiences. Cause that's my biggest thing. Like anytime people ask me what I want to do, my first thing is I want to grow my audiences. I want people to all over the world, all over the country to be able to feel me, to know that when you at the T3K experience, that's a whole different type of experience than anything that you've ever been to before. Okay. Um, so you spoke on uh, the DJ as your friend, and I see like yeah. you, you had a couple of DJs that you um, worked with as far as like doing mm -hmm. your hosting things. Is there a different vibe with the male DJ versus mm -hmm. the female DJ? I never even thought about it like that. That's a great question. I never really thought about it like that. Um, I would probably say... When it comes to women in any industry, I think there's always a level of understanding that is kind of like unspoken. It's kind of like you are another woman that's doing this. So I feel the need to kind of help you or to give you an opportunity to kind of put you on because I'm also in the same position and I know it's hard for me. Now, I might be in a little bit better position than you, but if you compare that woman to a male, mm -hmm. you're going to see a large gap. Definitely, I feel like men in, in the entertainment industry, it's a lot of entitlement. It's a lot of entitlement, when, it, especially if they've been doing it for a long time or they have connected with certain people and they don't know you. It's like, oh, who are you? It's been plenty of times I didn't went and asked somebody. I'm telling them who I am, what I do. they like, nah, I'm good. Okay. Like, it, it really ain't shit that I can say. But if I was to go up to a woman DJ, she might not necessarily tell me yes, but she might say, you know what? I, I'm not sure if, if I could do that, but talk to this person. Because that's the person that, that booked me and that's the person that I communicate with. So maybe they could give you the, you know, the answers that you need. Or if, if you clear with them, then you good with me type shit because you don't really want to step on no toes. So I would probably say that that's the biggest thing that sometimes when it comes to men, it's a lot of entitlement. 
um, when it comes to things. And then with me being a, a masculine lesbian woman, depending on who the male is or what their perspective mm-hmm. or their mindset is, you know, it's a whole lot of things that could already come with that. It's like, I'm not fucking with you because, oh, I feel like you want to be a man. Or I feel like you're trying to be something you're not. You, you don't know any yeah. of me, so, yeah. All right, so you got this double cup series. What was the the, the mission to start that? Like, why start a pod? Oh, well, I guess it's it's not a podcast. Why yeah, start, YouTube series. Yeah, so why start a series? Like, if you already like hosting and stuff, people see you. Why start a series? For sure. So the the series is actually something that I've been sitting on for like three, four years now. When I was graduating from college, I took a video editing class my senior year. And it really put me in touch with Adobe Premiere. So once I learned that skill, I was like, damn, I could do anything I want. And at the time, because I was really popular on campus and really popping in the city, I'm like, okay, I kind of want to capitalize on that. But time went past. I didn't really act on it. Not even going to hold you. I feel like I didn't invest in myself in the right ways because I had the equipment. Then when I moved out of my dorm, I was like, I don't feel like carrying this shit in my car to my new apartment. I'm going to just trash the shit. So then I got rid of a whole backdrop, all this shit now. Because at first I, I was going to do it with my homeboy. But we couldn't get the schedule right for the days that we was going to record. Then I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can edit it, but who are we going to get to shoot it? Now I got Now that's extra money that we got to put out, and it just wasn't lining up. And I feel like 2020 really taught me that I'm going to do shit for me. Like I'm not going to worry about what people think, how people feel. I'm going to do it for me. And it's crazy because originally the Double Cup series was really supposed to be more of intimate of who Taylor Moore is, not really Tay 3K. But as time progressed, I'm like, why limit myself to just doing that? Why not make it better? Because regardless, who I am is going to shine no matter what I'm doing. So once I just started developing it, I was like, okay, first episode, I rented a space. I'm like, nah, but the price I'm paying for that, I could build this shit myself. And so it's like that, really that investment that you put into your shit, because like, even with your show, like, I've been knowing about your show for like two years. Like the way that with the way that you put your shit together, the way that you promote it, it's creative, it's different, it's eye catching. You can tell that you're putting the time and the energy in it, and people can see that. You feel me? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mo. thank you for that. For sure, for sure. <laughs> um, all right, so with the series, when you pick in a topic, mm-hmm. um, are you thinking about a topic? Like, all right, I got this topic, I'm gonna bring this person on. Are you like, I got this topic, it go great with this guest type thing? Okay, see that that's a great question because I'm I'm actually trying to figure out what is the best way for me to do that? Because naturally enough, people want to be with the wave. So the more popping the series becomes, the more it's like, you don't even got to look for people because now people just saying, well, I want to be on it. I want to be on it type shit. And because I'm a very critical thinker, I always think like, is this person a good fit? You get what I'm saying? Because you could come on the show and the camera could start and you have nothing to say. And now I look like a fucking idiot <laughs> after you said you wanted to come on this show. Now I look stupid because you saw something that you felt like it was funny. You was like, damn, I want to have that experience too. So for me, the topics, I, I, I break it down in a framework. So I'll have bullet points that I want to go through throughout the show, whether it be a game, whether it be certain things that I want to say, reference something that I've seen on social media. Normally I don't pick the title until after the episode is done because I'll use something in the show to kind of reference the title. But I, I realized that over time, having more of a structure, like you said, where you know this guest goes good with this topic. So you put these two together and they gonna work no matter what because they go well with each other. Versus like, you could say something to somebody that might make them feel uncomfortable or they might not know how to respond to it and they could kind of completely throw it off type shit. So right now I just break it down in the framework and I pick guests based on who I think are entertaining who I think are exciting, people who I think have something positive to say, something meaningful to say. The other thing that somebody say, not always good shit. Yeah. So I make sure that I try to pick people that it's, it's a balance. Like, we would get the real and the ratchet at the same time. All right, now the set. The set mm-hmm. is, is dope. I ain't even gonna hold it. Appreciate I mean, it's, you, Rob. It's, it's appreciate dope. you. So I, I'm for sure people love when they come there. And for sure. You got, you be having the drinks and stuff. Got the backwoods. Now, are we getting yeah. sponsored by these people? That's why. I wish okay. I'm trying. I literally good. just started looking this shit up like two days ago. Like, how can I get a sponsorship from these people? Because this is who I am. I'm literally gonna buy Don Julio, whether you give me a sponsorship or not, because I drink Don Julio. You feel me? 
I smoke backwards or if it's some shit like me, I'm a real creative person. So I might see some shit that I really, really like. I'm like, all right, bet I can use this as a prop. I can use this because this relates to somebody else. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do the sponsorships. I don't know. We gonna, we gonna, we gonna figure that out. For the big companies, I'm, I'm really trying to figure that shit out. All right. Have you ever had a guest get wilder or say something wilder than you on the show? You just was like, damn, that was real wild. I didn't even think I was going to say that. Not def most definitely. I would probably say this was not the episode that drops this week, but last week's episode. I would probably say last week's episode... Uh, the girl who was the light skinned girl who was said on the left hand side, yeah, wild cookie for sure, <laughs> definitely, most definitely. Because sometimes it'll surprise me the shit that people be saying out of their mouth. Because I'm like, they really mean that shit. You're drunk. You was not fucking around when you said that shit. Yes, <clears throat> you really fucking mean that shit. But I love it because I want people to speak their truth. Mm -hmm. Like I say that all the time. Like that's your truth. If you don't want it in there, I'll cut it out or I'll bleep it out to where it don't. You know, make you look crazy, but. You, you clearly feel the type of way about it, so I'm going to let you do that. And that's one thing that I feel like makes my show different than any other show. Just personally, I want people to speak their truth. I want them to be honest. I want them to be relaxed. I want them to be cool. However they feel, whatever they want to say, it's not stupid. It's not dumb. It, I never had nobody like get emotional on the show and start crying, but if that shit happened, it, it's, yeah, it's a polar opposite of somebody turning up and getting drunk, but that person still speaking their truth. Like I don't, I don't want to do anything that's that's commercial or that's going to be too well put together to where it seems fake. But now people feel robbed. Even though I'm watching this video for free, I, I can't get that 30 minutes back of my life. So give me something entertaining to watch for 30 minutes. That's how I look at it. Okay. Um, so you on the airwaves, you hosting, you running a show, yeah. you want a pod, you a rep for a brand, right? Um, yeah, Panache. Panache. I'm a, a brand yeah. investor for a brand company. Um, with so many hats, what are you doing to relax? To, like take a break from all these i don't know i'm gonna be <laughs> honest with you <laughs> i feel like i don't relax at all like i'm always thinking about something and if i'm not I, i'm real hard on myself like i'm like damn okay nigga you need to get the fuck up like yesterday you was in bed all day watching movies so you need to get up and, and do something but honestly i'm doing all of this shit by myself so it can become almost exhausting to my brain to make it work so much on so many different things. Cause like you said, each thing requires a certain level of attention and it's all different. They might all work together, but they're all different. Something that I'm doing on double cup series is going to be different than what I'm doing on 92 kills. And then that's going to be completely different than what I'm doing at the club. And then even when it comes to the club, certain clubs that you go to, it might be a different type vibe. And me is, I consider that. And I think about things like that. If this is 30 and over, I'm probably not going to talk about shaking your ass. I mean, I am, but it's not going to be in the same way yeah. as if if it's an 18 and over event. And even in a, eight, a, club, a college party, I'm going to say something different than if I'm in a Houston nightlife spot that people buy in the $1,000 section. So, and when that's all coming from one person, it's just like, damn, a real tug of war. But honestly, I just want to go on vacation. I feel like a good five-day vacation on an island. I feel like that'll really yeah. just take all my problems away. It's well-deserved, well-deserved. Um, so I see in your profile you were teaching special ed. Yeah, I was. Um, do you? Why did you decide to like divert from that and to keep yeah. on with the uh, with your brand as it is? So I'll say mostly because I knew that that's that's not something that I wanted to do for the longevity. I love kids, and even before I was teaching, I was doing Freedom Schools, which is a summer enrichment program. Um, to like help kids improve their literacy skills. So for me, I've always had a love for community, a drive for community service and developing adolescents. So being a teacher was just like, okay, you need to substantiate yourself. And this is an opportunity for you to do it while doing something meaningful. So that's how I looked at it. But it began to feel like, because if I'm going to do it, I'm going to give 100%. And it was stressing me out because I taught special education. So it was stressing me out. And I'm giving literally 300% to, to teaching. And I feel like I'm giving no percent to take 3K. Mm -hmm. It was times where I'm literally telling people, well, you can't book me on a closing set Monday through Thursday because I got to go to work the next morning. And realistically enough, nobody wants to go to work with a hangover. But nobody who <laughs> teaches wants to go to work with a fucking hangover. That shit is terrible. So I'm like, nah, so now I'm missing out 
on that money, but it's kind of even and out with the money that I'm making for teaching, but this is not really what I love to do. I love kids, but the act of actually teaching is not something that I love to do. And Because I had an opportunity to go to grad school when I first graduated from Morgan. It was going to pay for everything. I was going to be an RD on campus at a school in North Jersey. And I turned it down because I'm like, that I don't want to do it. You feel me? I feel like if I accepted it, I would just be doing it. Because I knew I was capable of it, but my heart isn't in it. And one thing with me and anybody, if your heart not in it, it'll begin to show over time. You can only fake it for so long because the thing that really does have your heart, the passion that you really does, that you really do have, is going to be somewhere else. So now you're going to be giving your time and your energy to that when it's like, damn, but you really have these other responsibilities. You get what I'm saying? So. All right. Well, uh, since you don't teach no more, and that's, that's mm-hmm. perfectly fine. I feel like teachers run, they, they run their course. Like they don't got to yeah. do it the whole time. And on top of that, I will say that please don't go into teaching thinking that <clears throat> it's the easy way out. Yeah. I feel like that's a big misconception that educators, oh, if they, you can't do anything else, teach. And it's just like, oh, because all you're doing is reading out of a curriculum. And I went to college, so I know this, but these are literally <laughs> people's lives that you have in your hand. So if you're not ready for the time, the energy, the dedication, just don't do it. You could be an after-school coordinator. I promise you it's going to be a lot less stress, two to three hours out of your day, and you don't got to sit with these kids for eight hours and be concerned if they're going to pass a state assessment or not, or if they're going to know their numbers to 100 when they move to the next uh, grade level. Yeah, it's, it's definitely more than just teaching. It's like you like you said, you're developing a human being. Like they, miss, yeah. they could be missing something, or like if you work with special ed, like that's a whole nother like, Yes, yeah, a whole so, another spectrum on that yeah. But uh that I think that it takes courage to teach, period. Like no. cause it, it is like you build another person up and then you got so many little people. So Right, because some of these classes, I only had six kids in my class. Some of these classes have twenty plus kids. I've seen a class that has thirty kids in it. Yeah. One teacher, thirty kids. And that's stressful. Stressful. This is crazy. <laughs> But um, in what ways do you want to make sure you are still like implementing, you know, giving back and, you know, working towards that cause within your brand? Um, I feel like just doing it, honestly. Like, it's real simple. I did um, feed the homeless drive for Thanksgiving, and that's literally something that I did myself. I came up with the idea, and because I was on the air at the radio station, I'm just like, is it cool if we do a partnership with the radio station because the radio station was also doing community service. For me, I felt like I'm not from Houston. I want to reach the maximum amount of people. So me partnering with a Houston radio station is going to, I'm going to be able to feed more people. I'm going to be able to connect with more people and just doing it no matter who's doing it with you because anybody who does real service, no. People will be quick to sign their name mm-hmm. on a paper. But I ain't even going to lie. They'll show up and they won't do a no. motherfucking thing. They'll just be there. They won't take that picture though. I promise you, they're going to get in that picture and they're not necessarily really doing shit. So for me, find the need in your community and tend to that need. Homeless are hungry. Homeless will continue to be hungry. But you can't be doing Feed the Homeless every six months. I'll be honest. It's so many other things that you can do and so many different levels that you can tap into. Every community is different. Homelessness in Houston spiked in like 2018. It wasn't necessarily a problem that they had in 2016 or 2015. Somewhere like Baltimore City or Washington, D.C. or New York City, homelessness has been an issue for years. But then you go to L.A. and you go to Skid Row, that shit been going on since like the 70s. So it is kind of like find the need in your community and then make sure you tend to that. It don't, and it doesn't always have to be homeless. I mean, personally, I want to start an eight-week after-school program for kids. So and it's, I want it to be called Project Build and it's building up in the city youth through leadership development. So, no, I'm not being a homeless, but I'm doing something to my community that is going to impact my community because they're growing up here. And if they have a positive experience, I promise you they'll come back. Mm-hmm. And when they are at a level to succeed and monetarily be able to give, they're going to do it without even thinking about it because they feel like these people in this community are developing. That's just like LeBron James. He don't have no issue building a new school in Ohio because mm-hmm. without Ohio, he wouldn't be shit. And he recognizes that, but it's because he had meaningful people around him in and outside of the classroom. All right, last question. Sure. After you host an event, so like a party, club show, even a tour show, sure. what's that one thing you got to do is like tradition before you go home? Oh, that's a, I don't even know. 
don't know. Dang. I never even thought about that. Like, what's one thing I got to do after a show before I go home? I'm going to just say, it don't even, it could be at home before I get home. I'm going to have to smoke every single time. Like, that's me. If I can't do it during, I'm damn sure I have to do it afterwards. Because I feel like it kind of just, like, mellow me out for the night. Like, puts me in a reflective state. So it kind of, like, allows me to think about what the performance that I just put on. Because I'm, I'm a real tough critic on myself. And I do that to ensure that I'm always progressing and I'm always moving forward. I'll tell you this. You are in control of your own success, your own destiny. You don't get the life you want. You get the life you work for. So if you don't have the things that you want, Think about the work that you are or are not putting in because that's really that's really the gap between where you are and where you want to be. Mm-hmm. It's the work. You feel me? So people got to put it in. Definitely. And I will say, work hard, play hard. Like you got to take time for yourself. So now I'm about to find me one tradition to have before I go home. We got to do some cool shit now because <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Now, now, because next time I'm going to have some lit shit and be putting niggas on. <laughs> All right, boss. Well, thank you for being a guest on the show. I appreciate you for having me. No problem. No problem.